My name is Marco Staffney, Executive Director for the Montshire Museum of Science, and we're really happy to have everybody here uh, for a terrific Montshire Talks Frankenstein 200 program, a dramatic reading of Finding Frankenstein in Search of Mary Shelley, written by Don Brody and Tim Barrett. So the Frankenstein 200 series is a national program that's happening all over the country with museums and libraries and science centers who are celebrating the 200th anniversary of the publication of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. So folks all over the country are doing something like this. And this program was inspired by a program written at the Bakken Museum, which is a museum in Minneapolis. And it is a um, museum that has a lot of scientific instruments. So they decided to write a short play about the life of Mary Shelley and Frankenstein. Uh, museum theater is like a whole thing in the country. So all over the country, lots of museums and science centers and children's museums and art museums use the theater as an interpretive technique or tool to help educate visitors about content and things that is happening in the museum. So we've been very happy to partner in the last few years with Northern Stage to produce a couple of small scale productions. Last year we had Prehistoric, which is a dinosaur musical uh, that partnered with Northern Stage's Yes program. And I'm really happy today to partner with Amanda Ray Buse, who is the Associate Director for Northern Stage, and she will be performing this dramatic reading. After the program, I'm also happy to partner with a library uh, in the spirit of um, books and Frankenstein 200 with Ruby Simon from HAL Library. And we'll have a great discussion about Mary Shelley's legacy um, through the arts and literature. So without further ado, let's welcome Amanda Ray. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Finding Frankenstein in Search of Mary Shelley by Don Brody and Tim Barrett. I have been asked many questions throughout the course of my life. Questions ranging from, what is your favorite book? To, do you believe in God? But the question I am most frequently asked, however, is what happened that night in Lord Byron's castle, the summer of 1816? the night that I first conceived of Victor Frankenstein and his creature. I never mind when that, one is quest that question is posed because it is perhaps my favorite to answer. To answer it properly, the story doesn't begin with me. It begins with my half-sister Claire. Sometime before the summer of 1816, Claire had developed a terribly intimate relationship with Lord Byron. <sighs> True to his reputation, Byron tossed Claire aside once he grew bored with her, and Claire was looking rather desperately for an excuse to continue pursuing him. She suggested that she, I, and my darling Percy take a trip to Switzerland, where I could escape the chill of England's weather and people. Unbeknownst to me, Switzerland also happened to be the location of Byron's summer home. Despite the somewhat awkward circumstances of our arrival, Byron did allow us to stay with him, but primarily because he and Percy became instant friends. We spent pleasant hours on the lake or wandering its shores, but it proved to be a wet, ungenial summer, and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. It was then that some volumes of ghost stories, translated from the German to the French, fell into our hands. After spending a better portion of the time reading to us about the terrors we had never imagined, Byron proposed a challenge that we would, each of us, write a ghost story. I'm really sorry. I don't actually think I can do this. Um, I'm so sorry, Marcos. Um, I, I know, I know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing up here. I, I, I know how to read lines, you know, I, I, that's not the problem. It's just, what I'm supposed to say sounds a little something like this. <laughs> Dear Lord Byron, Shelley being in London upon business, I take upon myself the task and pleasure of informing you that we have, of late, taken a house in Marlow, to which we intend to remove in about two months, and where we don't hope to have the pleasure of your society on your return to London. Love, Mary. I mean, come on, <laughs> what is this? I have done Shakespeare, and I am telling you, this stuff is tricky. I'm really embarrassed and I'm really sorry. I know you guys came to hear a story about Mary Shelley and I just, I don't know how to do it. You've got to understand where I'm coming from. Mary Shelley is really complex. When I took this gig, thank you Marcos, I had no idea how difficult a character she was going to be. 
So I'm a professional actor. I hope you guys know that. I am a professional. I actually am. And I know when you're portraying a real historic figure, you have to start with the basics, right? You start with the vital statistics. So after doing a little bit of research about Mary Shelley, I came up with a version of the character that sounded something like this. I entered the world in 1797, and I died in 1851, which means I've been dead for 167 years. I was born at home in the outskirts of London. My mother didn't trust doctors, but she did allow one to treat her after the midwife left. It was not considered important in those days for doctors to wash their hands, and mother died of an infection 10 days later. Papa, my sister Fanny, and I then moved to Skinner Street in the heart of London. Now, London was a vile, ugly, disgraceful city, but I was within walking distance of a quiet, green, safe place where I could read and be alone, and that was St. Pancras' graveyard, where my mother was buried, and where I would spend hours thinking and making up stories. All right, so maybe you're saying, Come on, that's not so bad. We learned where she was born, how she grew up. There was a character, sounded like she had a British accent, sort of. Let's roll with that. But as I started to learn more about Mary Shelley, I realized that I didn't have her at all. First of all, that very proper performance of her ignores the fact that both of her parents are radicals. They didn't want to follow society's rules. They were rebels. Her mother in 1792, at a time when women were discouraged from even learning to read, wrote a book called The Vindication of the Rights of Women, a very popular sequel to her first and far less groundbreaking book, A Vindication of the Rights of Men. <laughs> It's true, she wrote that. Uh, they were both atheists, which means they didn't believe in God, and they thought that the institution of marriage as it existed in their time was pointless, and they said so often. In fact, there was at one point in Mary's childhood when there were five children in her house, none of whom had the same set of parents. So Mary, at the age of 15, apparently takes their word for all of this um, and decides to run off to France in the middle of the night with a very married 21-year-old poet named Percy Bysshe Shelley. And when I learned this, I was like, oh, okay. So Mary Shelley is not who I thought she was. I've been playing it all wrong. Maybe I need to play Mary a bit younger. The teenaged Mary, you know, fly by the seat of her pants kind of Mary. So my next version of the character looked a little bit more like this. Percy and I agreed that our time for flight had to be under the cloak of darkness. I stayed up all night, clutching my bag and watching the minutes tick by slow as ours. Finally, just before dawn, I tiptoed out of the house. Percy was waiting for me in a carriage, and after a brief embrace, we dashed away. At each stop, Percy had arranged for fresh horses, and we would leap from one carriage to another, like fugitives, all the way to the coast. Once there, we boarded a ship and weathered a fierce storm across the English Channel. <laughs> I mean, all of that's true but it's probably not quite the right way to portray Mary Shelley, in part because that personality doesn't really fit with all of the consequences that followed with running away with Percy. It was more than just a good story to share at her next girl's night. There were some pretty serious, serious consequences with that marriage. And first of all, her father, who is a radical himself, almost disowns her as a result of her marriage to Percy Bysshe Shelley. They don't speak for years. They never really made it up. And second, Percy is so much more than a fling to Mary Shelley. He was the love of her life, and they really stuck to each other through a lot of difficult times. She had four children with him, but only one lives past the age of three. They ran away from debt collectors for the better portion of their lives together. They only decide to marry after Percy's wife, who is pregnant at the time, commits suicide. Finally, finally, they are legally wed, and Percy sh drowns in a lake. So you can see what I'm saying. Mary has a lot going on. So with all of this, all of this confusion about who Mary Shelley is, I would like to propose a challenge to everyone in this room, sort of like Percy Bysshe Shelley did, with, or Lord Byron did that night in his castle. So here's my challenge, that all of us here try to figure out Mary Shelley together. I mean, 
I have a lot of information on her right here, and uh, I figured I'm all dressed up, so we may as well get started. So the first place to start with Mary Shelley is with her longest living child, her novel, Frankenstein. How many of you have read Frankenstein or see a movie, seen a movie, yeah, or, or theater production? So, yeah, not you, David? Never, all right, good book to pick up. I'll connect you guys. Um, okay, so I have gone around this over and over. You know the story. Yeah, okay, good. So I've gone around this over and over, and it feels like I come up with something different, but who do you guys think is the villain in Frankenstein? The doctor. The doctor? Okay, so the, the Victor Frankenstein? Yeah, any other thoughts? Who's the villain? Who do you think is the villain? It could be any, it's <laughs> the, the townspeople. The townspeople, yeah, right? Right, yeah. So the, what did you say? Yeah, Humanity is the villain. Yeah. All right, yeah, society is the villain. I mean, it's funny that nobody said the monster's the villain. He ends up killing a lot of people, but, you know, so he could be. So and the point is that that's the problem. What you, that sort of hesitation that you all had is exactly the problem, or not the problem, is exactly the issue with Frankenstein. There is no clear villain, and that was fascinating at the time for Mary Shelley's readers. Up to that point in time, there were very clear heroes and villains, right? You know, every book, the hero dressed in white and saves the princess, and the villain dresses in black and twirls his evil mustache, and, you know, bad things happen to him at the end. But suddenly Frankenstein comes out, and no one knows what to make of it. People are asking Mary Shelley, Mary, I loved your novel, scared the pants off of me. Quick question though, who am I supposed to hate? Because I kind of hate everybody. And Mary basically would answer that question in the same way she answered every question that was directly posed to her throughout her life with something like, I know, right? That's kind of what she said, which is not super helpful to someone who's trying to figure her out 200 years later. So when I first started trying to look at who Mary Shelley is and how she viewed Victor and the creature and society, I started thinking about Mary's intellectual pursuits. So Mary Shelley was part of what was called the Romantic Movement. You guys heard of this movement? The Romantic Movement was a philosophy, had nothing to do with candlelit dinners or roses. It was a way of thinking. And essentially, the Romantics all believed that life is about beauty and spontaneity and emotion and vision. And they focused on passions and embraced chaos. They rejected logic and reason. This was completely terrifying to the people in power who believed the, uh, in neoclassicism, right? Which is all about lines and order and rules and conformity. Does that sound familiar to folks? Yeah, cool. So speaking of sounding familiar, we have come to the name that tune portion of the show. So um, Marcos, I'm gonna ask you to play a couple pieces of music and see if you know what they are. Oh no, oh, no. I can sing it if you can't play it. So I'm gonna make you guys sing along with me in a moment, but. Um, oh, you're changing pictures. All right, so do you guys remember the song that goes, Lollipop, lollipop, oh, lolly, 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 lollipop, lollipop, oh, lolly, 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 lollipop. Lollipop. Boom, 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 right? You guys know that? So what's the name of that song? Lollipop. Do you guys remember who that's by? I know, I didn't either. It's the Cordettes. Um, so Lollipop was by the Cordettes, which was a band that was very popular in the 1950s. It was a girl group. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was a girl group in the 1950s. And so when you think about the 1950s, what are the images and ideas that come into your mind? I think of like poodle skirts. What were you? Conformity. Conformity, yeah. Or, or um, what else? Like what? Like I always think of Back to the Future. <laughs> so like... You know, ponytails and suburbia, the rise of suburbia. The rise of suburbia, yeah, yeah. Conformity is good. What else? The beginning of counterculture. The beginning of oh, the beginning. Oh, you're 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 jumping. Oh, the beat. Oh man, <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. But what were the what was the what was the culture that they were countering? Conformity. Conformity. Yeah. Bobby socks and you know that post-war. I, the suburbia, you said it, that sort of post-war boxes. Okay, do you think we have the second song? 
No? Would you like? There we go. <laughs> You guys know what this one was? Janis Joplin. What's the name of the song? Peace of my heart. That's right. <clears throat> That's right. So Janis Joplin, Peace of my heart. <clears throat> so do we think we have the pictures? Yeah. So there's the cordettes. Yeah. Right. This is a picture of the cordette. So as you can see, and this is the early 1950s. So probably a little prior to that counterculture movement that kind of started in 56, right? But these girls are well behaved, they're beautiful, and they're, they even look like it here, they're sort of waiting for their Prince Charming to come along and so they can get married and perfect their pot roast. Um, so the second piece of music we said that was, that was Janis Joplin and Peace of My Heart. Um, and there she is, we love her. Peace of My Heart by Janis Joplin, 1960s. So Janis Joplin, you know, she didn't like boundaries. She liked to push them. She liked to wear wacky clothes like that hat and furry vests and take slugs out of a bottle of whiskey in between verses of her songs when she's in concert. So try to imagine if Janis Joplin and her bottle of whiskey showed up at the Cordette's Pretty Pink Princess Party, and you kind of have a good idea of how the neoclassicists felt when the Romantics showed up in society. Pretty similar, right? Um, so the Romantics had a lot in common with the hippies of the 1960s. They were challenging women's place in society. They were questioning the re relationship between God and man, and they were also using drugs. Uh, so with that in mind, maybe Mary would sound a little something like this. And sometimes <clears throat> I could cope with the sullen despair that overwhelmed me, but sometimes the whirlwind passions of my soul drove me to seek by bodily exercise and by change of place some relief from intolerable sensations. It was during access of this kind that I suddenly left my home and bending my steps toward the near alpine valleys sought in the magnificence, the eternity of such senses to forget myself and my ephemeral human sorrows. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, that may not be the most accurate portrayal of Mary Wollenstonecraft Shelley, <laughs> but it's kind of fun. So it still doesn't really help us, right, figure out who this is, but it does tell us that Mary Shelley, who may not have cho chosen a traditional villain like the creature, you know, the creature is also not a hero. I, I mean, how do you react to a hero who also is a vengeful murderer? It's a really hard social construct. So let's say for the time being, as you guys said, that there is no villain in Frankenstein. What about the ending? I mean, does Frankenstein end happily? With all those people dead? It really doesn't. I mean, not to give anything away, sorry, David. Everybody <laughs> dies. Everybody dies in this book, um, which is pretty tragic. So that made me wonder, what do you think that Mary Shelley was trying to say with that incredibly tragic ending. So one possibility that's out there is that Mary Shelley was depressed, you know, and she considered this passage from Frankenstein. But I am a blasted tree. The bolt has entered my soul, and I felt then that I should survive to exhibit what I shall soon cease to be, a miserable spectacle of wrecked humanity pitiable to others and intolerable to myself. It is really bleak, right? <laughs> so even if that was the state of mind for Mary, I just don't believe that it was the most prevalent side of her personality. Because listen to this, also from the novel, same character, same chapter. My spirits were elevated by the enchanting appearance of nature. The past was blotted from my memory. The present was tranquil. The future gilded by bright rays of hope and anticipations of joy. 
<laughs> so thanks, Mary, ever helpful. So if the tragic ending of Frankenstein isn't entirely because of Mary Shelley's state of mind, the other possibility is that it was deliberate. Mary Shelley wanted to put a bad taste in her reader's mouth. Maybe. It's possible that she felt the same way about certain scientific exploration that many people still feel today, that messing around with the natural order of things is a bad idea, that it may not be a matter of an evil person causing problems because they're a villain, but rather good intentions in some areas of science will inevitably end up destructive. So Mary Shelley may have had a thing or two to say about science. She wasn't a scientist, but she went to a lot of scientific lectures and uh, some of the demonstrations that would still knock our socks off today. Um, so towards the end of the 19th century or 18th century, a man by the name of Luigi Galvani discovered that frogs' legs would twitch when shocked with different metals. He believed that electricity circulated through the body and he held public demonstrations that stimulated a lot of discussion in, in society at the time. And later, his nephew, Giovanni Aldini, elaborates and starts to reanimate human corpses. <laughs> he places electrical charges into the bodies of headless people and their legs and arms would start to twitch. So the, the bodies that he used supposedly were all executed convicts, but body snatching was a really a prevalent problem at the time. <laughs> a lot of people stealing corpses for scientists, for medical students, so it's hard to say who the bodies were that he was experimenting on. But at any event, it was apparently quite a big thing, as you can imagine, to see a corpse with a severed head bend its knees or extend its arms on a scientist's command. And I think it would be shocking for us today, right? Don't you? I mean, even though we're used to electricity. <laughs> so imagine what you would think seeing demonstrations like this when your experience with electricity was lightning, static, or some really weird fish. You know, it's interesting. So suddenly, science is telling you that this phantom, mysterious force that's out there is making dead people move. So Mary Shelley sees a few demonstrations takes part in a few conversations which suggest that people are exploring ways in which electricity can bring the dead back to life. She spends a few sleepless nights thinking about this, picturing the worst case scenario were this science to actually succeed, and suddenly, boom, we've got Frankenstein. Mary is, um, she's by the way often called the creator of science fiction because she was the first to write literary fiction inspired by the science of the time. Uh, science fiction continues to respond to whatever is considered the Frankenstein science of the day. So, for example, this is actually one of my favorite movies. In the late 1980s, um, science was starting to make really good prog progress with the science of cloning. They were successfully cloning simple organisms, and then suddenly, July 5th, 1996, they cloned a sheep. Do you guys remember that? Dolly, that's right, Dolly the sheep. <laughs> so Dolly caused quite a stir because suddenly the average citizen understands in a very vague way that this new science kind of makes two of something with just a little piece of one thing, right? People didn't really grasp the science of it, but it stirred the imagination when this happened. Stories of experiments like these stirred the imagination of a very successful fiction writer named Michael Crichton. Does anybody remember what movie came out of that <laughs> science? You know, dinosaurs, right? So he was talking about cloning, actually very successful movie franchise that still continues to this day, 20 years later. Um, so good for him. So like Frankenstein, Jurassic Park got a lot of people talking about the science of cloning. It raised a lot of questions about what happens if we go too far in experimentation without considering the consequences. So go back a little bit farther to the 1950s, and the science of the time was atomic bomb testing. And that made the average person very aware of the effects of atomic fallout and nuclear radiation, right? Including the possible bizarre side effects of mutations. Some imaginative people sat down, wondered about it, painted a worst case scenario, and what the audience got were movies like this. <laughs> Them! <laughs> okay. Here's what's gonna happen, folks. All this atomic radiation is gonna take our bugs and make them ginormous. <laughs> they will crawl out of the ground and attack and eat all of our blonde women. <laughs> or, or worse. Here's another one. Atomic Age Vampire! Wah! 
The radiation isn't going to just turn us into monsters, it's going to turn us into old school monsters. And once again, who are they going to target? Watch out, blondes. <laughs> it's gonna just get the blonde women. So this spine-tingling motion picture that only the atomic age could produce before your very eyes, the terrifying transformation of man into monster. <laughs> Scary stuff. So galvanism, that electricity through the body, was the Frankenstein science of Mary Shelley's time, atomic radiation of the 1950s. So what do you think are some of the Frankenstein sciences of today? AI? Yeah, artificial intelligence, I totally. Yeah, think of your, your Roomba, you know, taking over your house. <laughs> yeah, AI. What else? I, I mean, fracking, actually, I think is a, a science that people are discussing, right? The, the questions and the, you know, what the consequences are and nobody knows for sure. Disasterism related to climate change. Yeah, climate change, yep, totally, disasterism. I think biological weaponry is another big one, and maybe that's, that's sort of an ongoing thing. Cyber attacks. Cyber attacks? Pandemics, yeah, yeah, totally. What else, anything else? So there's a lot, there, I mean, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of potentially scary science out there, and maybe that's the point, is really any science, if it's taken in the wrong direction, the wrong impulses can be scary. Um, so I will say though that I have a little bit of a hard time thinking about Frankenstein as a book about science because there is really not a lot of science mentioned at all in the book. I don't know if you guys remember that from reading the book. So does anybody recall exactly what scientific process was used to reanimate the creature? Yeah, anything? Do you remember what was involved? What did you say? I don't think it ever really said. Doesn't ever really say? Do you remember like sort of what was involved? Like I always think of the movie, there's always lightning. The lightning. The lightning, the lightning going down and like sh shooting yeah. through the electric. Okay, I think of young Frankenstein. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's alive. The f yeah, there's like a flash. There's the flash is the same thing that somebody can stick a lightning in terms of the super. Right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 all right. Pretty vague is the point, right? <laughs> At least in our memories. So you're absolutely right. Nobody knows for sure. Here's what Mary Shelley writes about it. <clears throat> this is Victor Frankenstein talking. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishments of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning, the rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. That's the animation process. So try this in your next biology class. <laughs> Bring a dead frog to life and then <clears throat> take it up to your teacher and when she says, how did you do that? Say, I infused it with the spark of life. <laughs> okay, well, how did you get the spark of life? <clears throat> I used the instruments of life. <laughs> I don't think they'll accept that as an answer. <laughs> so there you have it. Um, this, we've been about 20 minutes now, and I am still confused as to how to talk about and how to portray Mary Shelley. And as long as I've been researching this woman, she seems to just delight in being vague and undefinable, just like her book. There does seem to be one exception to this rule. People continue to ask Mary throughout her life about her book and what she thought of the characters and what inspired her to write the novel. And finally, in the republication of Frankenstein in 1825, in the introduction, Mary speaks for herself and she says, as the daughter of two persons of distinguished literary celebrity, I should very early in life have thought of writing. Still, I had a dearer pleasure than this, which was the formation of castles in the air indulging in waking dreams, following trains of thought, which had for their formation only imaginary incidents. My dreams were at once more fantastic and more agreeable than my writings. What I wrote was intended at least for one other eye, but my dreams were all my own. I accounted for them to nobody. They were my refuge when annoyed, my dearest pleasure when free. 
For invention, it must be humbly admitted, does not happen out of the void, but out of chaos. I was only 18 when I wrote Frankenstein, and upon its publication on New Year's Day, 1818, I had survived my father's rejection and England's disapproval of my affair with a married man. I had survived the deaths of my mother and my baby, the suicides of my half-sister and my lover's wife. I had survived and I had created my hideous progeny, my story, Frankenstein. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. So it's really interesting to hear a dramatic reading of a play that you are thinking about Mary Shelley. And so what I'd love to do is bring up Ruth Simon from the How Library and Amanda. Uh, just ask a couple of questions and maybe just talk a little bit about Mary Shelley in general and what her influence has been in, on literature and, and the arts. So I'm going to start with you. What, what do you as a library director, what do you, what do you think Mary Shelley or, or what's her place for us? Yeah, I mean, I thought that was a great question you posed. Um, you know, what has been her legacy as readers? And I think, like any timeless classic piece of literature, um, it it has the basic ability to transcend across different aspects of what's going on in the world mm -hmm. at different time periods. I think that we could see through some even film. Mm -hmm. um, it touches various forms of conversation pieces like it, this particular book like many others you know it covered religion law science art human nature so um, I think because of that ability of uh, you know a piece of literature like this or this art form and I think various art forms that can do this you see it influence very variations of other aspects of our world so I think the impact on this particular piece of literature has, I think, if you look at other books, any type of, mm -hmm. I think, horror book or particular genres, it's influenced um, what is, you know, obviously it's a big piece of the gothic horror fiction, mm -hmm. it's a big piece of science fiction to some extent. Um, as I was reading and doing a little bit of research, uh, a new genre which I was not familiar with, which was called lablet, um, was also I think come you know came out of this in some ways, and um, which is somewhat uh, uh, similar to science fiction, but um, was interesting for me or our librarians as we're trying to find different genres and what people like to read. Um, We've seen how it's influenced, you know, a lot of new literature pieces. Yeah. What is lab lit? Like, what is, is it? So it's based in laboratories? No. So no. it's very interesting. Yeah, I was gonna lab. I'm yeah. glad you brought it up. So, because um, I was trying to figure out and distinguish what's the difference between sci-fi. Because for yeah. me, like, this is totally sci-fi. But it's it, sure, it's L A B and then L I T. Oh, lab. lab lit. lit. So basically, yeah. how it's defined is lab lit is a. Uh, it's a genre of fiction distinct from science fiction that centers on realist portrayals of scientists and on science as a profession. So basically, it depicts realistic <laughs> scientists as central characters and portrays fairly realistic scientific practice or concepts and typically taking place in a realistic as opposed to speculative or future world. So it's so many comic book movies or like the, the yes. bug, like yes. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. Not the, the bug, fly. the fly. Yeah, the fly. <laughs> the bug. Yeah, Jeff Goldblum. The when flea. You think the fly, so what? That's yeah. Easy. It's Jeff yeah. So, um, so you can see how it's influenced all these other types of writers, and and you see the you know it trickling into uh, you know graphic novels. You yeah. Know, some of our more traditional and favorite loved horror stories, but um, I think other similar books like these that one of my favorite was always Dracula. Sure. Where you have Jekyll, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Mr. Hyde um, that fall within this. So you can see how her influence, you know, has uh, impacted very other other types of literary forms. But um, And I just have to I have to ask, were people just not writing about science before then? Or was it just that books were becoming so much more part of the popular uh, form of entertainment at that point that there was more writing opportunity. Do you know I what I'm asking? I think it's a little bit combo of both, but I think you know, like you said, there was a certain time of romanticism or yeah. anything. So what was you know at the time? I think there was probably some subversive writing that mm. you know we don't hear or see about, where it was in these kind of uh, what you call kind of like novellas. Mm. So some of that could have been in there, um, but. Um, 
I'm sure there was more. I don't have off the top sure. of my head other titles that are specific to sci-fi, but I think yeah. that was, I think, as people are always contemplating, like, what's out there beyond us, there's definitely, you know, some... I was just reading literature. today that Herman Melville read Frankenstein, and his book is profoundly shaped by it. That makes and sense. Oh, yeah. 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 And also, there's a lot of science in that. It's the parts of on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that's an issue because you have the whole human nature. So who's yeah. the monster mm -hmm. at some point? You know, it's that back and forth. But yeah, and we look um, at it now with an environmental perspective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little different. Yeah. I but I, well. one of the funny things I also was as I was reading, like this was also considered like soft sci-fi. Huh. So I was like soft sci-fi. You know, so I thought that was also interesting in terms of because it's not you know like we said based in yeah there yeah, wasn't enough real science, the yeah. real science that was in there. So I thought that was actually a cool genre form. So I'm going to go look to see if I can find some more soft sci-fi. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I was reading too that, that, that Mary Shelley sort of weirdly had some, I think of Jane Austen, and they seem like they're so polar Tiger, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, I was reading some, I, I, this is going to sound really funny, but have you guys ever read a book <laughs> called Pride and Prejudice and Zombies? Mm -hmm. I've yes. it at the library. You've yeah. sheltered it at the library? <laughs> It's actually really great. I and read it. I actually <laughs> loved it. Yeah, it's really yeah, great, yeah, right? Yeah. He really uses. He, yeah. It's really funny. It's great. Um, sorry. Contemporaries, uh, both turn of the century. Remind me, English was a long time ago. Um, she was a little later. Yeah. Yeah. She was a little, yeah. Yeah. You know what's? Now I'm getting my dates confused. Yeah. Somebody Google it. Yeah. Don't somebody have yeah. a communication <laughs> device out there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but that so this it just goes to like the horror and the science fiction and the anyway. But also thinking about Mary Shelley and being a a romanticist and even Sense and Sensibility is about that conflict too, right? Of romanticism versus neoclassicism. If you just look at those two characters of, of conforming to women's society, yeah, society exactly. and breaking through those, yeah, yeah. And you know, Eleanor is very much the romantic and all of that. Um, so that's what it made me think of. But I, I'm with you too. Somebody actually mentioned as you're think, talking about the the arts in this book and its influence on the arts. Somebody said, "Oh, it's just like in the cartoons. They always show," <laughs> and it, it like it crosses. It, so even if you don't, even if you've never read Frankenstein, you know Frank, you know the story, you know the, you know what's happened, you know, and so somehow this particular tale of good and evil within humanity and what's possible is so relevant that I think there's it, the the impact has probably gone beyond um, even being able to quantify in some ways. Um, which is fascinating to me, that people keep on wanting to retell this story and wanting to, in different ways, wanting to retell this story. Uh, I, I went and saw, and maybe you saw this too, the Benedict Cumberbatch, there was a, the National Theater did a production of, of Frankenstein, um, but they did some serious editing of the play itself. And you know, I, I was there with a friend of mine and her 12-year-old son who had just read the book, and he was like, there wasn't a rape scene in the book, you know? <laughs> but, there was, but there was in this play. You know, they really, because they really wanted to explore this darkness. And they actually, it was, it, was, it was more than two actors, but they had Benedict Cumberbatch and Johnny Lee Miller um, swapping Frankenstein and the creature. So each night, one of them would play the other role oh, in order That'd to really yeah. explore that, you know, who is the bad guy, what is the evil, where does the evil come from? And there's some really fascinating conversations that the two of them have, because of course I was a dork and Googled everything after <laughs> watching that. And, um, and, you know, the two of them <clears throat> saying how, how difficult it was on some, in rehearsals particularly, to jump from one character to the other, in part because of the mental, the men, the, the, the you impact. You gotta get in somebody's head to be able to portray that. Yeah. That and also just like the, the, the good and evil aspect of it. I think that each of those characters, especially Frankenstein, thinks that he is doing the absolute best right thing, right? He is, he is being, He's experimenting and he's trying to figure out how to bring people back and it's really, you know, it's his own, it's his own personal life that he's, he's trying to fix. And then the monster 
sort of, I don't know, if there's a whole other discussion about whether he has a soul or the humanity of that, right? But um, anyway, that's a fascinating. So more the point is that there are different versions of this story, I think, are, that are being retold constantly um, and in really interesting ways. Uh, and that I just think it's a question that we're s always struggling with is what is good, what is evil, and and how are we, you know, as a society, answering that question? Um, and I think that's one of the focuses of the foci of art is to is to think about those things that humanity is thinking about all the time. Yeah, I think it brings so, in that human nature piece. Yeah, but I was going to throw out another movie that I think Young is Frankenstein. Like, well, no. yeah, that was yeah, it was Star Wars. <laughs> oh yeah, Darth Vader. You think about you know all those pieces and uh, yeah. you start looking more and more. So yeah. So Mary Shelley, um, as a writer, is often considered the author of the modern myth. Uh -huh. So yeah, as a female means. writer um, doing this in 1818, it's a pretty impressive. Who do you think are contemporary female writers, whether it be in theater or um, in the best kind of books that you might experience, that are, are helping to shape what might be the new modern myth? Hmm. Wow. Oh, God, that's a hard one. Can I, I step know. back for one second and talk a little bit about at this time in theater, like what I think Mary Shelley also was also did was broke down the barrier on stage. She started to, that we start to see with Ibsen and with Chekhov pretty soon after her, that move from going from, from very melodramatic where there's a good and evil into actual human conversations and human relationships. Um, so, that, but that, that's just, you know, theater history 101, just thinking about that time period and how people were exploring things. Um, so I don't have an answer yet for your modern myth, but did I give you enough time to think about it? Yeah, no, <laughs> that's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't think, I mean, I'm sure there's, I just think of so many authors and like genres. Like Tony, like Tony Morrison or Bob or, um, yeah. Oh, there's, yeah. There's it, different genres and there's different movements. It's hard to pick one that, um, I don't know. Has anyone yeah. have one on the top I'm of the? I'm thinking I mean, of Oedipus Rex. Tony Morrison. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Tony Morrison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm thinking of uh, Oedipus El Rey, which is a newer play um, that sort of starts and tries to explore that in 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 more the Greek tragedy sense. Um, again, re-examining re, re those the human condition through that lens in a modern perspective. That sounds so important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. She's a good, yeah, she's interesting. As a librarian, you just mentioned, oh, there's just all these genres of books. And I know a big challenge in managing a library's collection is like, well, what are those books mm. we're supposed to have? You know, from that trade paperback to the literature to the Oh, the educational, you know, nonfiction. Yeah. Looking at Frankenstein now, you know, she falls into oh, the classic section mm -hmm. of the library collection instead of the horror or science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. But at her time period, there was there was definitely still those categories of fiction. I mean, there was, you know, all those trashy romance novels yeah. for you know, yeah. young women to read, just as there are you know, all through time. What genre do you think she fell into in her own publication? Because she couldn't have landed in classic on the first year. <laughs> no, she would not have been a classic. Well, so gothic. I yeah. mean, at that time, she probably wouldn't have been in the library. Like, yeah. they wouldn't have put her, yeah, like, probably her collection in a. Um, I think, you know, even now, when we categorize where popular. things are, yeah, it's more where we see where. <laughs> people are going to look for certain things. So our goal is to make sure it's accessible. <coughs> so at the time, she probably could have been, um, I mean, it, she probably would have fallen into general fiction yeah. or romantic. Pop popular yeah, fiction. Yeah, so popular fiction <laughs> yeah. at that time. Yeah. Um, so I mean, and even now, as we, I mean, we have various selectors who have very specialized areas. So and sometimes they question, like, should this book go here, or do you think mm. people were, are more likely to find it here? So um, you them in multiple copies in different places. Mm. Right? Uh, we try to not do that oh, sometimes because I'm that, like, that's a great idea. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> not, it's, sometimes, yeah, no, it's a challenge. Sorry, it's mainly, it's mainly in the youth reading section, huh. or your high school section. 
Yeah, we try not to. Or the kids I, reshelf. Yeah. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our catalog, when you look up, the last thing we want to do is send people a million mm. places. So, um, and every library could possibly put it in their classic sections, or they might put it in their sci-fi section, or they'll put it. They may have a gothic horror section if that's like their most popular area. So, right. um, like we have, you know, a lot of people love mystery, so we've pulled that collection out and has its own collection. So, oh, yeah. I mean, I think at that time, if you think about really the number of genres and probably how big collections and how libraries function in those days, they were probably a lot more research-based research than recreation mm -hmm. and fiction. So she was probably one of those personal items or novella that someone kept in their bottom drawer hidden in their, <laughs> in their home. Yeah. Right. And you think she fell in the... In a respectable, was it a respectable highbrow or lowbrow novel at the time? I don't think she was respected yeah, highly. I, yeah. And that, that introduction in the 20s was pretty yeah. risque. Yeah. And you think there's, I mean, at those times also, there was women that changed, you know, they had their names. Yeah, yeah their George names Elliot to come and, off yeah. as male writers in order to either be published yeah. or wrote under other male writers. So. Um, so I think at the time, yeah, she was yeah. rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. she was young. That was also a big one. So, yeah. 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 Mary, um, this is for all three of you. But Marcos may have the most to say about this. I hope so. I was fascinated <laughs> when I saw that Monshire was doing this series on uh, Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, and I thought it must have to do with Marcos being interested in this. And I understand the 200th anniversary. Is this the only science museum on the planet doing it, or are science museums taking on Frankenstein, and why? Sure, um, I can move into that. So there's um, specifically 50 science museums and libraries that are part of an initiative called Frankenstein 200 that uh, are looking at how um, culture is influenced by science and so they're using it the, as a spark to be able to do that and it's organized through an organization called NISNET which is the National Informal Science Education Network um, so they organize sometimes large-scale nationwide not global-wide initiatives for uh, science museums and libraries to um, to do this kind of work. I would say the majority of the science museums that are doing this work are uh, doing it more on the younger uh, realm of science education, so making things like Scribblebots, which is like a small robot that jitters um, and creates art. Well, did the robot create art? Did you create the art that the robot created? There are a lot of questions that can happen with very basic um, robotics, um, taking up topics of artificial intelligence, um, deep learning. So there, there are there are young versions of this, and there are a few museums and universities who are looking at this as a more academic. Um, topic uh, we have chosen to look at different topics like for um, the philosophy of science and the questions that came up with um, you know the basic question of philosophy is what is life like what makes something mm. alive mm. and that mm. is um, something that's prevalent in this particular book and then with the moral responsibility of creating something that then does harm right. so we looked at that in artificial intelligence last week with a professor from their school of engineering at dartmouth college so really looking broadly at um, where you know this conversation of science and culture and the, and the blending of them has been inspired by something as fun as the book frankenstein um, is, Which is, the others are using also? Yeah, and there's many. Everybody's using. Everybody's using Frankenstein because it's the 200th anniversary. Yes, so, I guess that. Yeah, so, uh -huh. so that that's um, so folks are doing it all across the country. A lot of universities. So if you go into YouTube right now and type Frankenstein 200, uh, you'll see other talks happening across the country. University of Arizona is a major contributor to this. They created a lot of um, kits and information for museums and libraries to use. Um, specifically with like the maker movement, I know the HAL Library has maker programs inside of it uh, where they're getting kids to really get engaged with um, making robotics, electronics. Um, so the museums and libraries are, are sort of joining forces on getting kids to also be active and young adults to be active as well. So the, you know, both organizations or both museums and libraries are uh, sort of blending how science and culture work now. So cool.
Yeah, and it's great because it's really kind of creating that uh, being able to build on those critical thinking skills like how do you bring science with art and combine those and you know we think about a lot of things we're doing today as we do programs like we try to combine textiles and art with you know there's new softwares that you have to learn how manufacturing works and design so we're combining all of those pe pieces at various age ranges so kids understand how you know that critical thinking piece pro uh, process works. Um, There's a couple of years ago I went to an FCC workshop training about innovation and access to information and there was a great teacher there. She had just started a school in New York City and she was talking about the biggest challenges was particularly in our, this day and today and with our youth is you know we're, we're really teaching our kids to be consumers of technology and we're mm -hmm. really not teaching them on how to be content makers. And so that's you know that's I think where this initiative around making spaces and steams and all these types of curriculums is where we're trying to really you know move you know kids adults young adults to think in that way because technology is coming in quickly and it's yeah. it's creating a whole other I think it's 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 a slippery slope once we realize like we think we know but there's that other side of it. And that's why we need the ethics raised by Frankenstein so that as these kids are creating they're thinking about the, the dimensions exactly. of what yeah. they're creating. Yeah. 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 I mean, I would say that the book Frankenstein is more uh, like a poem to moral ethics more than it is about technology or... Yeah, I think that's a great analogy, yeah, and, yeah. And ultimately, it is like, am I responsible? Who is responsible? Um, mm -hmm. And in both cases, the creed, I mean, it's true of what this particular play we saw today is that there is really no true villain in this. Right. It's really about how we perceive context and, um, you know, how we make particular choices. I asked our professor who talked about artificial intelligence last week, you know, can you program morality? You know, ultimately, mm -hmm. like, the, we're still trying to figure out morality as humans. Yeah. So how, yeah. how do we think about morality as, as, uh, as technology? Yeah. So, so with that, I want to thank very much Amanda and Ruby. Thank you so much. For But with that, thank you so much for this program series, and we're glad that you came.